Welcome everyone, I'm the Body Counter, and this is part one of my Red Coast to Broken Oblast series, where I share with you the setting of my book's alternate timeline, the events that transpire, interesting and important characters, the nations and alliances, and much more. In case you haven't seen my introduction video to the series, I'll leave a link to it in the description below so you can get caught up on the series. And now, let's begin. Veneto, Italy. Late 1917. The combined strength of Austria-Hungary and Germany break through the Italian front lines during the Battle of Caporetto, capturing upwards to around 250,000 Italian soldiers, many of them willingly giving themselves up. Italian High Command is on the brink of chaos and disorder as the Central Powers move closer into Po Valley. The Battle of Caporetto is where this timeline branches off from our own, the catalyst event which would shape the future of the war and post-World War I Europe to come. Karl I of Austria-Hungary would request German assistance in the campaign. Erich Ludendorff would decline the call for assistance, to which Karl I would ask Kaiser Wilhelm II himself for assistance. Wilhelm would overrule Ludendorff and German High Command would send in the 14th Army. Once the German and Austro-Hungarian advanced down the Alps and began to overextend their front lines, the Italians would take positions along the Piave River for preparations to resist a second potential attack. In an attempt to keep the momentum going, General Otto von Bello would request half of his forces remain in Italy and promises Hindenburg, Ludendorff and the Kaiser that the war is to be won through Italy. The Kaiser and Hindenburg saw the potential of the offensive and agreed to split the 14th Army into two corps. One would remain in Italy under Otto von Bello's command and the other to return for the upcoming offensive in France. Ludendorff was aggravated by this decision, but would instead forget the change in plans and relocate more forces from Belorussia and the Baltics to reinforce the Western Front. Belo, now in charge of the Corps, would concentrate his forces along the southmost area of the Piave River, where the river was much smaller in width. By early December, the German Corps would strike the Italian positions, causing a breakthrough in the south. Following the breakthrough, Austro-Hungarian forces would reinforce the Corps' flanks. Venice was now encircled, and once the city was surrounded, the Austro-Hungarians would push through the breakthrough point, cutting off yet another few thousand Italians attempting to reorganize and retreat. The siege of Venice would last for two weeks and see the Austro-Hungarian army and navy shelling the city. We're surrounded. No shit! The Italians would attempt to break the encirclements with little success due to the German reinforcements. In surrounding the city and putting civilian lives at risk, Italy would begin peace talks with the Central Powers. Other factors weighing on Italy's eventual surrender was a now growing unrest in the civilian population and the army's unwillingness to continue the war. January 1918, Italy signs a peace treaty with Germany and Austria-Hungary, with many conditions being the handing over of all Central Powers POWs in captivity, the surrender of stockpiled artillery, planes, motorbikes, horses, railcars, ammunition and firearms. Not to mention the withdrawal of all Italian forces home and abroad and allowing the Central Powers access through Italy in order to strike southern France. The Entente knew of the impending surrender and began to withdraw their forces from Italy to the Franco-Italian border and the bottom of the French Alps, with many thousands of troops being captured within the now occupied nation. For the German and Austro-Hungarian empires, Caporetto was a complete success that brought the capitulation of Italy. For the Entente, a catastrophic defeat. Holy crap, Morale had reached an all-time high amongst the Austro-Hungarian military and peoples back home, proving that the empire was still capable of enduring towards a victory. This did not, however, keep the ethnic tensions within the empire at a low, and many ethnic groups within the dual monarchy still demanded autonomy, such as the Croats and the Czechs. By the time Karl I was coronated, the young king and emperor would begin planning a federalization of the empire into a series of autonomous nations under a cooperative economic and military alliance, in an attempt to keep some form of the empire alive that he was born to lead. The reformation proposal was both loved and hated amongst the empire, primarily hated by the Hungarians who did not wish to see even one nation earn the same level of power as Austria or Hungary did. No large-scale reformation process would begin until the war's end. Following the surrender of Italy, many units of the Austro-Hungarian forces would utilize Italian weaponry as their standard issue weapons till the war's end, due to the massive abundance of arms and munitions received in the peace treaty, substantially increasing the Austro-Hungarian army's strength in combat. Once all of Italy was occupied by the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Franco-Italian Front was established by the Central Powers, the Entente made an important decision to transfer portions of their expeditionary forces from the Macedonian Front in order to support the Western Front before the arrival of the Doughboys. March 1918 the Joint Central Powers Kaiserschlacht and Province Offensives would begin, with the Germans striking deep into northern France and the Austro-Hungarians pushing down the Alps. Little did the Central Powers know at first that France was facing an internal issue of a particularly red variety. 
By June of 1918, a series of socialist protests by French workers and peasants along with another string of army mutinies would plague the country and its military. In Bordeaux, a large socialist protest would emerge within the city, provoking unrest amongst the civilian population of southern France and threatening the stability of the nation's government. Sparked by many socialist writers and ringleaders, the Bordeaux protest would be overwatched by a French company of 110 men, who would then be instructed to put an end to the protests as peacefully as possible. The French company would begin to displace the protesters. And then it happened. Shots were fired on the 20th of June. Eyewitness accounts vary from person to person, but the most supported account is that a socialist worker pulled a handgun on a group of soldiers and opened fire, to which they retaliated. Despite the initial attack potentially coming from one of the protesters, the retaliation which followed was severe. The company would gun down 45 protesters, both men and women, many of which didn't do anything. Of those detained after the shooting were Marcel Sembat and Leon Blum. Sorry if I'm butchering the pronunciations. Two prominent French socialists who attended the protest. The suppression of the rally only angered the socialist movement in France, demonstrating to many that reformation was unlikely. However, revolution was a possibility, and that's when Jules... Oh, God damn it. 122. Jules Guedes, en réalité, a... Jules Guedes, Jules Guedes, Jules Guedes... That's when Jules Guedes stepped in. As a socialist politician and journalist with rather revolutionary ideals, he was a wasp, and the uprising was the wasp's nest, and he wasn't going to wait to be kicked around again. Guetta would use this terrible incident as a lever to fuel the revolution. And boy, the French love those. Did somebody say revolution? Over the next few months after the German capture of Amiens, Guetta would gather a second movement within the city of Bordeaux in secret, assisted by the mayor of the city, Adrien Marquette, who was coincidentally a socialist who viewed revolutionary principles, and by August, Guetta and Marquette would form the first militia, a 10,000 strong force of farmers, factory workers, civil workers, and soldiers who had deserted from the front, the latter who would train and solidify the militia in terms of training and strength. Late August would be the time, the time to strike. As their offensives would begin to bog down, the Central Powers would notice the sudden absence of troops on the front, not just including the French, but Commonwealth and newly arrived US troops too. The Germans and Austro-Hungarians would discover that a socialist rebellion was brewing, and forces were now being pulled from the front to garrison the major urban centres of the nation. A rather naive move, as many new socialist supporters were widely spread out in the countrysides of southern and western France. A second follow-up offensive was in order, but for now, the Central Powers were getting their logistical issues in order and rectifying their supply problems. Early September saw the socialist movement of France absorbing the regions of Nouvelle Aquitaine, Occitanie, and portions of Auvergne Rhone Alps, with Bordeaux being the capital. Pockets of Republican fighters would begin to pop up throughout the Socialist Republic, and many self-formed militias would begin to pop up throughout the Republic territory. September the 10th can be seen as the beginning of the French Civil War, with the Socialist militias making their first advances on the encircled forces near the French Alps, and making a small push up north. At the beginning of 1919, a second Joint Central Powers offensive would begin, with the Austro-Hungarians defeating what remained of the Republic forces in the Rhone Alps area, and the Germans managing to capture several port cities in the north and reaching the outskirts of Paris. A devastating siege of Paris would begin, threatening the French heartland and putting the government's will to fight to the test. The siege would last for four months, with the German offensive continuing to push the UK and US forces out of key coastal positions. The will to fight was no more for France, and in June 1919, the French Republic officially surrendered, being unable to continue a conflict against both the Central Powers and the Socialist State. The Treaty of Paris was almost as harsh as the Treaty of Versailles in our timeline. Almost. Germany demanded war reparations and land, but allowed the French army and air force to remain untouched until the French Civil War had concluded, because the last thing Germany wanted was another socialist country bordering them. The city region of Nancy would be absorbed into Alsace-Lothringen, Luxembourg and eastern Belgium would be annexed into Germany, with the German puppet of Flanders Wallonia being formed. The territory of Flanders Wallonia would also be given French Dunkirk, Lille, Malbourg and the Ardennes Forest region. A majority of the French navy was, however, seized by the German Empire, with a few ships even being given to Austria-Hungary. Ships that refused to be handed over to the German hands and would rather continue their operations in the French Civil War were either sunk by German ships or scuttled by their own crews before the German seamen could board them. Put your hands up. No. What? I said no. Why not? I don't want to. But I've got a gun. I don't care. Not having to worry about fighting the Central Powers in France, the Entente would now focus all their efforts onto halting the Socialists in the South. Britain and the US could have left and continued the war against the Central Powers elsewhere, but it was a mix of goodwill and fear of socialism rising up in Western Europe that kept them supporting the French. The war in France may have come to an end, but the Great War was still ongoing elsewhere in the world. 
The Ottomans had sued for peace and were in the middle of an independence war of their own. But for now, the only real front left to fight in was the Macedonian front. Now reinforced by German and Austro-Hungarian forces, the Entente had to move quickly if they were to make any real breakthrough into Bulgaria. In October 1919, a combined British, Serbian and Greek offensive punched into the Bulgarian front lines, costing the Entente forces heavy casualties. With the initiative transferring from the Entente to the Central Powers hands, a German, Bulgarian and Austro-Hungarian counter-offensive struck southwards, moving into the Halkidiki Peninsula and taking Thessaloniki. Unfortunately for Greece, having sent 70,000 to 80,000 troops to fight in the Greco-Turkish War, hindered the military strength on the mainland and the government was forced to sue for peace. Bulgaria would receive all of Macedonia, including the Halkidiki Peninsula and Thessaloniki. Greece would be severely damaged politically and militarily after peace terms, and the Greco-Turkish War would stir further into Turkey's favour. For the rest of 1919 to February 1920, the Great War was little more than a scaled-down phony war, with the Central Powers now dominating mainland Europe, with the United Kingdom still thinking they had a fighting chance. At least they still had their enthusiasm. In December and January, the Royal British Marines and Navy would commit to small-scale raids along the German-occupied coasts of Belgium, in an attempt to prod the German defenders and damage their navy. Four raids took place along Belgium to little success, but their final and surprisingly successful raid took place against a set of docked German destroyers and one light cruiser in Hamburg, sinking one destroyer into the docks, severely damaging the other and the light cruiser, but doing more harm to the civilians on the docks than the crewmen. Come February 1920, Britain signs an armistice with the Central Powers on the 18th of February, formally ending all hostilities between the Entente and Central Powers. While this was the end of the Great War, the Treaty of Calais would mark the official surrender of the United Kingdom and its allies against the Central Powers. The United Kingdom would suffer just the same as the French Republic in the Peace Treaty, losing many of its colonial possessions, such as in Africa, along with the Suez Canal and Hong Kong being the most important gains. The British would be forced to withdraw their forces from the Middle East, leaving the region to form their own leaderships and borders on their own. While conflict was brewing elsewhere, such as in France and Russia, the German and Bulgarian peoples celebrated the end of the Great War, emerging as the new power nations of the 20th century Europe. Many families took to the streets and celebrated the end of the conflict which had changed history. Many other families would mourn the losses. While Austrians and Hungarians were in a celebratory mood, the same could not be said for the rest of the other ethnic groups within the empire. Resentment grew as their chance for independence from the Entente was a lost opportunity. They now had to wait for the slowly progressing reformation process by Austria-Hungary for the next few years to come, before they would be inclined to celebrate anything. Over the next five years, Karl I would grow in popularity among the Empire's government and people for his promises of reformation and autonomy for different regions. Hungary, however, grew very toxic over the idea of scaling the Empire to that of a federation alliance. But with the king still leading the people of Hungary, it was difficult to argue against him, and the Hungarian government was reluctantly forced to go along with the king, with Karl I promising that Hungary would still have military priorities and overlordship over Transylvania, Bosnia and Slovakia. As for Britain, a devastated population was left in tears and depression, and as for France, a fate even worse, as the struggle for the Republic continued, as the French Civil War would grow to become even more destructive for the nation than the Great War had ever been. I hope you enjoyed part one of my Red Coast to Broken Oblast series covering the end of the Great War. Next in the series, I'll be covering the French Civil War and the reformation of Austria-Hungary into a Federation alliance. If you enjoyed, feel free to like the video or comment your thoughts down below. Share this video with other history buffs in order to do your part against the socialist French in the South. Subscribe to keep up to date on my future uploads. And as always, keep on fighting!